Welcome to the Sand Hills Media Ministry. We hope this production encourages and challenges you to live a more Christ-centered life. I appreciate that. Thank you, Pastor Jack, for bringing the podium. Uh, what beautiful weather. So, unfortunately, you won't be able to get out here too early because I'm going to use up every 35 minutes that I have. Uh, <laughs> so let's pray before we get started. Uh, Heavenly Father, we just ask that you would open our minds to your word, that we might understand it and know it. And that it simply wouldn't sit there in our brains, but it would penetrate our hearts, that we would see the Lord Jesus Christ in it. And as we see you more clearly, that that would change us. And that day by day, we'd be conformed to your image. We also pray for the people in Israel. Um, hearing about the war that's been started by Hamas and the cities that have been invaded, uh, hundreds of people that have been killed. And God, we pray that your hands would be on that situation, that you would bring peace, that you'd bring reconciliation, and Lord, we pray for revival. The heart of man is desperately wicked. And without you, there is no hope. And the people of Israel have so much of your word, and we pray that they would finally have so much of the Savior. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so my mind is there in Israel. It's just a terrible situation. Um, but we're excited, I'm excited this morning to continue on in our study of 1 Samuel. So as we read each of the verses in chapter 22 and unpack the story, we're also going to decipher the story behind the story. And here's what I mean by that. There's one story at the surface, and that's the story of the history of Israel as it transitions into a kingdom led by kings, first King Saul, and then King David. But there's also a story behind the story. And we know this is true. We can look at 1 Samuel this way because Hannah's prophetic poem or prayer in chapter 2, the themes of the book are laid out. So it's not just history, but God is using the story to lay out some important, some crucial spiritual truths. And these are the themes that are laid out in Hannah's poem. One, God opposes the proud, but exalts the humble. The second one is that despite evil, God is at work to bring about good. And the third one is that there will be a future messianic king. In this future messianic king will be God's ideal king who establishes God's ideal kingdom. And of course, we know that this ideal king is Jesus, amen. These themes are played out through the book as we see Saul's rise to power only to have his character flaws exposed when he disobeys God. In contrast, God raises up David, a humble shepherd who trusts God. As the story progresses, we see these two characters in increasingly stark contrast. Saul slips into madness as David begins to learn to show us what it is to walk by faith. And in this story, David becomes a kind of forerunner of Christ who foreshadows who the Messiah will be in his character and actions. Not that David is perfect, we know that. But he was a good king who does give us an early picture of the perfect king to come. So in that way, David teaches us what it is to walk by faith. And so what does it mean to walk by faith? It means that we believe that God is working for our good even when we can't see it. It means we faithfully serve God with what we've been given. It means that we treasure his word. It means that we turn to him no matter what the circumstances are. It means that we learn to see the world and people the way that he does. It means that we choose righteousness over sin and it means we live our lives not for our pleasure but for his glory. And that's what I want us to see today in 1 Samuel 22. What it is to walk by faith. So as we process the story and the story behind the story, I want you to ask that question of the text. What does this teach me to walk by faith? Before we hit verse one, let me give you a brief recap of what's brought us to the point in the story. David has killed Goliath through a tremendous display of faith and courage. This makes David an instant national hero. The people love David, and initially so does King Saul himself. Saul brings David to the palace to play music for him because Saul seems to suffer from what I would describe as major depression with some psychotic episodes. 
And the only thing that seems to bring comfort to King Saul's troubled soul are David's songs. However, there are some other songs being sung in the kingdom, songs about David, uh, and these songs push Saul over the edge. After David's victory over Goliath, the women of the land begin to sing this song, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. At first, Saul keeps his jealous rage to himself, but then he begins to devise ways to get rid of David. However, everything Saul does to destroy David seems to elevate David in power and popularity. Saul eventually offers one of his daughters to David for a mere 100 Philistine foreskins. Instead of getting himself killed, though, David kills 200 Philistines, gains a wife who loves him more than her father, and further admiration and respect from everybody but Saul. Then Saul's envy becomes public. He gives orders to his son Jonathan and all his servants that David is to be put to death. So Saul sends men to arrest David in his own home, but his efforts are foiled largely by his own daughter, Michael. From this point on, David keeps his distance from Saul, turning first to Samuel and then to Jonathan. It quickly becomes evident to David that there isn't going to be any reconciliation with Saul. He must flee and become a fugitive. And so David flees first to Nob, where he lies to Ahimelech, the priest, to get his assistance. David is given the showbread and Goliath's sword. David then flees to the Philistine city of Gath, the hometown of Goliath. This proves to be a very bad decision on David's part because the song that everyone has been singing is that David has slain tens of thousands of Philistines. And so to get out of that mess, David pretends to be crazy. He scribbles on the doors of the city gate and lets saliva run down his beard. And that brings us to verse 1 of chapter 22, which says, So David left Gath and took refuge in the cave of Adullam. So I have some experience in being in caves, and one of those experiences was in a cave that I explored in Africa. There's a picture on the screen for you. And this is a cave in remote western Kenya near the border with Uganda. It's on the side of a mountain called Mount Elgon. Uh, It's right near Katoom Cave. I can see some of you Googling right now. So I'm there with one of the locals as a guide. Animals and people would go to the cave as a place of refuge to find shelter from weather or enemies. And one of the cool things I found out about that cave is that there are salt deposits on the walls of the cave. And since it's hard to find salt in nature and animals need it, elephants would travel to the cave and lick the salt off of the walls. I didn't see any elephants uh, when I was there, but I did see some other wildlife in that cave. Lots and lots of bats. And so there's a picture of a bat right there. And interestingly, when I got back to Nairobi, that's the capital and big city of Kenya, I told some of my African friends about being in that cave. They told me, yeah, we know that cave. That's where Ebola came from. (laughs) Yeah, I almost wet my pants right there in Kenya. You know, because Ebola is a viral disease where you bleed out of your pores and then you usually die. They made a movie about it called Outbreak. However, I did some research, and that cave was not the cave where Ebola came from. That cave was about 20 miles to the north. However, in this cave, there was something called Marburg hemorrhagic fever. And it is the same thing as Ebola. It looks the same. The only thing is more deadly. And so (laughs) that's the cave I was in exploring. I have other pictures. I'm covered with all of the stuff in the cave. Uh, But thankfully, I didn't contract it, and don't worry, uh, I've lived this long, so I'm probably not contagious. (laughs) So I know none of you want to see me after the service. (laughs) So what I did discover that relates to our story is that cave, maybe, caves may be a place of refuge, but they're not a place you want to stay for long. They're a good place to hide, but not good places to live. And I wonder how David felt being in that cave in Adullam. And I wonder this because being in a cave was probably not the program that David had envisioned when Samuel had anointed him to be king over Israel. Kings live in palaces. They have servants. They eat great food. They enjoy all the luxuries that life can bring. And up to recently, David has spent a lot of time in the king's palace playing music for Saul. Uh, He had boldly stood up to a giant with faith and courage, and now... He's on the run. He couldn't go back to his house. He couldn't go back to the palace. He couldn't go back to Samuel. He couldn't go back to Jonathan. He couldn't go back to the house of the Lord, and he couldn't go back to the ungodly Philistines. Saul's agents were looking for him in all of those places. However, he could go to a humble cage 
humble cave and find refuge. I don't know about you, but if I were holed up in a cave trying to save my life from a madman and his army, and if it seemed as if God had promised me something which he was not delivering, probably the last thing I'd do would be to write praise songs. But David did do this. He wrote two psalms about his experience in that cave, which the Spirit included in the scripture for our benefit. The first one is Psalm 142, and he gives us great insight into what David was feeling when he was in that cave. So the title of Psalm 142 says, when David was in the cave, a prayer. It says, I cry aloud to the Lord. I plead aloud to the Lord for mercy. I pour out my complaint before him. I reveal my trouble to him. Although my spirit is weak within me, you know my way. Along this path I travel, they have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see, no one stands up for me. There is no refuge for me, no one cares about me. I cry to you, Lord. I say, you are my shelter, my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry, for I am very weak. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. Free me from prison so that I can praise your name. The righteous will gather around me because you deal generously with me. What do you hear in those words? I hear a man who is overcome with anxiety and sorrow a man who feels alone and trapped, a man who feels overwhelmed and powerless. But I also see a man who has discovered that walking in faith means that we bring our brokenness to God. Sometimes when I'm going through a difficult time, and maybe you are the same way, I find myself trying to stuff and minimize my despair, my distress, and my sorrow under a blanket of spirituality. I say to myself that if I had more faith, if I trusted God more, I wouldn't feel so overwhelmed and I wouldn't feel so powerful, powerless. Yet in the example of David, we find something so critical about our relationship with Christ. It's the recognition that the path to greater faith comes as we honestly see all of our struggle, pain, and distress, and then bring it to him, the Lord, recognizing that he is really the only one who can heal us and make us whole. In this world, broken things are despised and thrown out. Anything we no longer need, we throw away. Damaged goods are rejected, and that often includes people. To us, broken things are despised as worthless, but God can take what has been broken and remake it into something beautiful, something that he can use for his glory. Amen? And there is something about reaching a breaking point that causes us to seek the Lord more sincerely. Broken things and broken people are the result of sin, either because we are caught in the consequences of our own self-destructive choices or because we are the victim of someone else's. Yet God sent his son who was without sin to be broken so that we might be healed. On the night before he died, Jesus broke bread and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Jesus went all the way to the cross to die so that we can live. His death has made it possible for broken, sinful humanity to be reconciled to God and to be healed. In that cave, David came to a turning point in his life. I don't know if you saw it in the recent chapters we've been studying, but David was moving from a man showing great faith and courage to someone who was beginning to make some bad choices. In the past, when David faced Goliath, he remembered how God had delivered him And he courageously challenged Goliath the Philistine, saying that God does not deliver by sword or spear. But in the last chapter, David, overcome by panic and fear, asks Ahimelech the priest for a spear or sword. He jumps at the opportunity to take Goliath's sword, declaring it to be a weapon without comparison, and then goes to Gath and Philistia to seek security from his enemies. David is obviously not walking by is obviously walking by sight, not faith, and trusting in his own strength at this point. But walking by sight eventually fails, and David, who has earlier lied to Ahimelech, is forced to live out a lie by pretending to be a madman. This denial that God is the true source of his security, that God is his true refuge, is the culmination of a series of actions that deny God's mighty work in his life. But as David sat in that cave, and spent time with God, he came to realize that the only true refuge anyone can ever have is God himself. The second psalm that David wrote in that cave, um, Psalm 57, I want to read the first three verses to you. 
It says, be gracious to me, God, be gracious to me, for I take refuge in you. I will seek refuge in the shadow of your wings until danger passes. I call to God most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. He reaches down from heaven and saves me, challenging the one who tramples me. God sends his faithful love and truth. The psalm speaks so much about refuge, and to be clear, let me define what that means. A refuge is a safe retreat, a place of healing and renewal. In 1 Samuel 21, 22, 1, it says that David sought refuge in the cave of Adullam, and he did find a safe retreat there. He did find a place of healing and renewal, but these two psalms we looked at show that it wasn't really the cave, it is the Lord himself. And the implications of this is that we can be anywhere and in any circumstance and still find a safe retreat in a place of healing and renewal. So David discovered that walking by faith means that we turn to God as our refuge. Not the things of the world, but God himself. I spent a lot of time just in verse one, but I did this because it sets the stage for the rest of the chapter. As David has found his refuge in God, things begin to change for him. And this is contrasted with Saul, who descends into deeper madness and sin because he doesn't walk by faith. So let's look at the rest of verse one. It reads, when David's brothers and his father's whole family heard, they went down and joined him there. And this is a precious gift from God because previously all David had was trouble and persecution from his father's from his father and his brothers. Now they join him at the cave, and I wonder if this is part of an answer to David's prayer for rescue. God sends him, his family, so that he won't be anxious about their situation, and they can support one another. Some others now join David as well. Verse two says, in addition, every man who is desperate in debt or discontented rallied around him, and he became their leader. About 400 men were with him. And I would expect that the envy that consumes Saul and the single-mindedness to kill David has led him to expand his vicious injustice past David and into the rest of the kingdom, causing a wave of desperate and discontented people. So we see these men making their way to David. In David, they find hope. Becoming outlaws against the evil king, it seems natural that they would seek out Saul's rival, David, a hero who honored God and had been cast out like they were. There are many ways in which David foreshadows Jesus, the coming savior. And we see this here in this passage where David rallies the outcast and the unwanted of Israel. Like David at Adullam, Jesus gathered a band of followers that the world could describe only as riffraff, a bunch of undesirables that the Pharisees derided as tax collectors and sinners. Fishermen such as Peter, James, and John, a tax collector such as Matthew, and nobody such as Philip, Bartholomew, Thaddeus, and the others, not to mention a train of women led by the once demon-possessed Mary Magdalene were not the kind of followers who offered access to cultural influence or who wielded worldly power. And yet, because Christ had called, equipped, and empowered them, they began to change the world. Paul said this of the early believers in 1 Corinthians 1.26. Brothers and sisters, consider your calling. Not many were wise from a human perspective, not many powerful, not many of noble birth. And before long, the wise, powerful, and noble of the world at that time would complain of their inability to stop the dynamic power of Christ at work in his people. In Acts 17, 6, they cried out in alarm, these men have turned the world upside down. And as we believers today reflect Christ in the world and we learn to walk by faith, we should begin to see the least of these as incredibly valuable just as Jesus did, just as David did. And also because for most of us, that's who we were. So walking by faith means that we have a heart for the overlooked and the outcast. But it also means that we don't have to fix ourselves before we come to Jesus. In Revelation twenty two seventeen, there is an open invitation to the world, and it says, "Come, let anyone who hears come. Let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life freely." In these and other verses, the clear implication is that though we are sinners, God desires us to come to Him as we are, so that He can cleanse us. So the invitation is to come as you are. But the amazing power and promise of God is that He won't let you stay that way. As you turn from your sin and turn toward him, he will transform and renew you. 
What a beautiful truth that is in the scriptures. That gives us so much hope. Verse three. From there, David went to Mizpah of Moab, where he said to the king of Moab, please let my father and mother stay with you until I know what God will do for me. So David wanted his parents to be safe, whatever battles he may face in the future. So he took his parents to Moab. This is an interesting choice, because this is directly across the country where he was in the cave in Adullam. And it's also, Moab is a part of, it's a different country with unbelievers in it. But he probably went there because he has a family connection there. He has a great-grandmother. Do you know who his great-grandmother was? Ruth, the Moabite. And so maybe because of that, he took him there. Uh, and so he brings comfort to his family in that way. David also says something interesting in this verse. He says, until I know what God will do for me. So David doesn't know the whole story. He doesn't have the full plan from God. He knew he was called and anointed to be the next king of Israel, but he had no idea how God would get him there. David had to trust and obey when he didn't know God's specific plan. So there's some observations I want to make about discerning the will of God. First is that for believers today, we have the Holy Spirit within us to guide us. So the process for us doesn't involve finding a priest and using an ephod like it did in David's day. Secondly, Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So if we fill our minds with worldly things, if we constantly consume inappropriate movies, songs, words, and images, we're going to have a hard time discerning the will of God and also a difficult time, I think, walking by faith. We renew our minds by having his word fill our thoughts. I love Philippians 4.8. It says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And we have that in our mind. It is so much more easy to see what God requires of us, what he asks of us, and how to follow him. One last word about knowing and doing God's will is this. We can certainly ask God what to do in a specific situation. We can ask him whether we should take a job or not take a job, whether we, can, whether we should marry someone or not marry someone. And he may give us an answer for that specific question, but the majority of how the Bible approaches this is that our minds are re- as our minds are renewed, we gain wisdom and understand what God values, and then we apply that to the situation. So in the case of a job, in the absence of clear direction from the Lord, we ask if it would be wise to take the job. And secondly, does it violate any of the principles found in Scripture? And if it is wise and doesn't violate Scripture, then you take the job. So if we do that, we don't need to agonize over missing God's will. And I hope that brings you some clarity. That could be a whole sermon. Verse four, so he left them in the care of the king of Moab and they stayed with him the whole time David was in the stronghold. Then the prophet Gad said to David, don't stay in the stronghold, leave and return to the land of Judah. So David left and went to the forest of Hereth. I love how David at this point hears the word of God and immediately responds. This seems to indicate that his faith has become stronger as he eagerly and willingly obeys the word of God, leaving the safety of his stronghold and going back to the mission that God has called him to. As followers of Jesus, we should also display the same kind of eager willingness willingness to obey his word. Now the story is going to switch to Saul and what he's up to, so we're going to move a bit faster because Saul doesn't give us examples of what it means to walk by faith. He pretty much shows us where envy and sin can take someone and is not a pretty picture. Verse six, so Saul heard that David and his men had been discovered. At that time, Saul was in Gibeah, sitting under the Tamarisk tree at the high place. His spear was in his hand, and all his servants were standing around him. Saul said to his servants, listen, men of Benjamin, is Jesse's son going to give all of you fields and vineyards? Do you think he'll make all of you commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds? That's why all of you have conspired against me. Nobody tells me when my own son makes a covenant with Jesse's son. No, none of you cares about me or tells me that my son has stirred up my own servant to wait in ambush for me, as is the case today. So news of David's movements have come to the ears of Saul as he was holding court at Gibeah under the Tamarisk tree. 
His servants stood about him when he began fuming at the news regarding David. And Saul raved, listen, men of Benjamin, is Jesse's son going to give all of these things to you? It seems that Saul, in his paranoia, thought David was turning his followers against him by offering them a promise of land and authority once he took over as king. And then Saul begins to whine as he said, nobody tells me when my own son makes a covenant with Jesse's son. None of you cares about me. That is not a good picture of the king of Israel. And it seems that self-pity and fear have totally gripped Saul to the point that he could only be comfortable if those around him felt sorry for him and entered into his warped conspiracy. Most people who find themselves in service to a ruler like that are frightened by that kind of wild accusation. And he's making that accusation against his men around him. But some see it as a golden opportunity, as did Doeg the Edomite, who now comes onto the scene. Uh, David had written a whole psalm about him. I don't have time to go through it, but it's interesting to look at that. So verse nine, then Doeg the Edomite, who was in charge of Saul's servants, answered, I saw Jesse's son come to Ahimelech, son of Ahitub at Nob. And Ahimelech inquired of the Lord for him and gave him provisions. He also gave him the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. So the last time we saw Doeg was in chapter 21, where he was in Nob at the tabernacle at the same time that David was there with Ahimelech. And so Doeg implicates the priest Ahimelech as David's accomplice And Doeg was more than an ambitious man looking to promote himself. He also knew how to divert Saul's anger and suspicion from himself to the priests. I really dislike guys like Doeg. (laughs) Sometimes it seems though like there's no shortage of people who stand behind the person in charge and selfishly manipulate them just as he did. Does that seem like there are a lot of those people in the world? Verse 11, the king sent messengers to summon the priest Ahimelech, son of Ahitub, and his father's whole family who were priests in Nob. All of them came to the king. So they get summoned by the king and they bring everybody because this is probably going to be a good thing to be in the palace before the king and they know that they are priests of the Lord and they've been doing this service with dedication. So they walk into the situation and Saul asked him, Saul said, listen, son of Ahitub, And then he responds, I'm at your service, my Lord, he said. Saul asked him, why did you and Jesse's son, it's kind of a term of derision, conspire against me? You gave him bread and a sword and inquired of God for him so he could rise up against me and wait in ambush, as is the case today. Which, of course, is not true at all. David doesn't want to ambush the king. And over and over again, he honors the king as God's anointed. But this is where Saul is gone. Ahimelech replied to the king, who among all your servants is as faithful as David? He is the king's son-in-law, captain of your bodyguard and honored in your house. Was today the first time I inquired of God for him? Of course not. Please don't let the king make an accusation against your servant or any of my father's family for your servant didn't have any idea about all this. But the king said, you will die, Ahimelech, you and your father's whole family. What a response. Notice that Saul is angry with Ahimelech simply for performing his function as God's servant. And Ahimelech's answer reveals his innocence in ministering to David. Now, it might be possible that the priest sincerely did not realize that David was out of favor with the king. Or maybe, alternatively, the priest may have been simply courageously confronting Saul over his well-known injustice to David. What is true is that confronting sin is part of the job for those called to communicate God's word. 2 Corinthians 4.2 says this. Instead, we have renounced secret and shameful things, not acting deceitfully or distorting, distorting the word of God, but commending ourselves before God to everyone's conscience by an open display of the truth. In this instance, it's not David who gives us an example of what it means to walk by faith. It's now Ahimelech as he stands before a powerful and dangerous man boldly proclaiming the truth. Ahimelech clearly unmasks Saul's unjust malice toward David. It was precisely because Ahimelech's reply was so noble and true that it drove Saul into a murderous rage. Ahimelech teaches us something difficult. He teaches us that walking by faith means that we proclaim the truth. 
Sometimes this is difficult because people don't want to hear the truth. They're either comfortable or trapped within their lies. But church, God calls us to speak the truth in love. And he does this because it's the truth that shows our desperate need for a savior. It's only through the truth that we can be healed and reconciled to God. So speaking the truth is the most loving thing that you can do for someone. There's so much more I'd like to say about this, but we're gonna move on to verse 17. Then the king ordered the guards standing by him, turn and kill the priests of the Lord because they sided with David. For they knew he was fleeing, but they didn't tell me. But the king's servants would not lift a hand to execute the priests of the Lord. So the king said to Doeg, go and execute the priests. So Doeg the Edomite went and executed the priests himself. On that day, he killed 85 men who wore linen ephods. But he's not done. He also struck down Nob, the city of priests, with the sword, both men and women, infants and nursing babies, oxen, donkeys, and sheep. Proverbs 14.30 says, A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Saul shows that his envy has now fully corrupted him. He is rotten to the core. He sends Doeg the Edomite to perpetuate one of the greatest acts of evil ever recorded in the Bible. And it's interesting that years earlier, Saul had not been able to bring himself to slay the evil Amalekites and their cattle. Now he, through Doeg, obliterates all of the priests and everyone in that town. And you'll also notice that Saul calls the priests, priests of the Lord. So he recognizes that these men were specifically set apart for God's service. So the, this verse implies that Saul was really getting back at the Lord himself as his enemy. That's a very dangerous game. And some would say that by doing this, Saul is one of the early antichrists mentioned by the Apostle John in 1 John 1.18. So can we learn anything from Saul? I think we can, and it's that walking by faith means that we find our satisfaction and significance in Christ. As I read about Saul, I get the sense from him that he's never satisfied with his position or his wealth, and he feels insignificant compared to David. Do you get that impression from him too? Yeah. He's incredibly insecure and filled with envy, and I think he has become this way because he sought fulfillment by pursuing selfish ambition, materialism, sensuality, and comparison with others. Sadly, I think as believers, we might often do the same. Envy makes it on God's top 10 list, right? It's part of the 10 commandments. Do not covet. So it's something humans have an inclination for. And Saul's story is really a cautionary tale that shows us where allowing envy can lead us, where turning our back on God can lead us. And his story should drive us away from following in his footsteps and drive us to Christ as the source of our satisfaction and significance. Verse 20. However, one of the sons of Ahimelech, son of Ahitub, escaped. His name was Abiathar, and he fled to David. Abiathar told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord. Then David said to Abiathar, I knew that Doeg the Edomite was there that day, and that he was sure to report to Saul, I myself am responsible for the lives of everyone in your father's family. Stay with me, don't be afraid, for the one who wants to take my life wants to take your life. You will be safe with me. So news of the massacre at Nob reached David through the one survivor, Abiathar, the son of the high priest. And now the severity of David's sin of lying to Ahimelech at the tabernacle is brought home with bitter clarity as he acknowledges that he knew Doeg would inform Saul. And now we see the consequences of his lie. Unlike Saul, however, David is someone who owns up to his actions and takes responsibility for what has happened. And in his response, we we see David living out his calling as a true anointed king over Israel. He turns away from his personal fears and concerns and embraces his duty to shepherd the people that have come to him. Stay with me, he tells Abiathar, for the one who wants to take my life wants to take your life. You will be safe with me. From this point on in the life of David, he would succeed in being a refuge for Abiathar and many others who sought safety with him. Yet from what we've read today, David himself knew that the only the Lord can be our true refuge. And the refuge that David did offer to others was only because he found his refuge in the Lord. 
And I think that brings us to the final lesson of the story. As you walk by faith in the Lord, stop looking to the world for your security and significance and turn to Christ as your refuge. Let's pray. Lord, as we read this story, which seems from such a faraway place and such a long time ago, I pray that his truth would penetrate our hearts, that we'd be able to, to see part of ourselves in this, to understand humanity and our weaknesses. But Lord, we are so thankful that we do have a refuge that we can run to, and we pray that as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, you would be our first love, our first refuge, and our first Lord in all things. We ask this in your name. Amen.